Hello, I'm Chip Stewart for Hub International. I'm head of the real estate practice uh, nationally. And today we have a couple of guests with us today. Our topic is protecting your board members. And uh, after the, uh, the collapse of the Chaplain Towers, uh, we've learned from a lot of our clients what they're really concerned about. So we're gonna be talking to those uh, specialists within Hub today that can give us a little bit of light. And to that end, we have Lindsay Shapiro from Risk Services, Mark Morris from our executive liability practice, and Jonathan Nakaro, who heads up our HOA um, uh, uh, practice for all our homeowners, sorry, our, our condo owners associations. So I'd like to welcome all our guests in here, and we're gonna get right to, to the meat of it. And I wanna thank you for attending too, and all the questions that you've submitted. I uh, really appreciate those questions, and we'll be uh, answering those as we go along. So keeping our residents safe, that is one of the things that uh, everybody's thinking about right now after the horrible collapse and really what it means to me. What does it mean to me as a board member? Uh, what does it mean to us as uh, tenants? And what does it mean to us as owners? Um, so Lindsay, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, uh, what you see in risk services? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, to point out on this slide, we're talking about engaging building safety experts, um, you know, on an ongoing basis and having inspections done and engineering reports. So um, at some point or another, for various different reasons, you'll need to hire a trained or and qualified inspector to help you identify any issues and provide a detailed report of your property. Um, inspection frequency, depending on the um, type of report, uh, would be just dictated on several different factors, such as you know age, exposure of the building, if it's um, on the ocean, you have sea salt, if it's in an earthquake area, um, looking for signs of deterioration, things like that. So inspections could happen on an annual basis, a biannual basis, or you know every five years. So it's important to talk to experts around that, what they recommend, as well as follow your local um, jurisdiction. So that's a little bit about um, inspections there. So Lindsay, what, what, if I'm a board member, at what point do I say, hey, I want to push this? I really want to talk about having an inspection done of our building. What are the, the red flags that you see that I should be looking at? Um, if you're a board member in general, uh, you know, you sh should have a, a good idea of, of your property um, and have some sort of internal audit process. If you have some internal inspections done, having um, maintenance that uh, folks that are trained in facilities on the property itself. And when there's any signs of deterioration um, or post catastrophic events, whether it's a hurricane or a blizzard or a snowstorm, taking a look at the property um, and doing a self inspection after that. So if anything does come up that um, you look towards uh, hiring an expert to come in and do a report for you. And then it says, do not delay the repairs. How, how, does, how do you keep from having that happen uh, when you're in a, in a big company or uh, you're dealing with a homeowners association? Um, you know, as a board member, you, you're, you're not pulling the trigger on these things. How, what, what, what sort of things, you know, happen in, in the, in, with delays? And, and what did we see with the Chaplain Towers? I think there were some delays there, weren't there? Yes, the, um, I, I think that there were. I haven't read through all the reports yet, but just in general, I could speak to just building uh, capital uh, improvements into your budget today is just very, very important, um, along with identifying risks early. So something that could help support this, like I mentioned, is training maintenance staff and leadership to recognize potential signs of risks, which may help then identify issues prior to those formal inspections, um, but just instituting sort of financial planning for major improvements, capital expenditures um, in a building maintenance plan is, is key because when you put off the issues due to um, funding issues or anything else, it just, it can put the building and its occupants at risk. And then there's one last uh, bullet point that you have here for us here, which is, you know, being proactive and consistent with communication with the tenants. Sure. Yeah, that's um, definitely key as well. Um, and I think maybe Jonathan might have had some points for this slide as well, too. Jonathan, what do you think? Yeah, thank you. You know, something that Lindsay had talked about just, just now was basically outlining a reserve study scenario, being able to budget for long-term capital, 
capital expenditures, uh, things like a roof, things like a waterproofing project that are a significant investment for many of our boards, especially our communities living in high-rise luxury condominiums. One thing I do want to highlight in the tragedy that happened at Champlain Towers is that in the state of Florida, there is not a requirement uh, to conduct a reserve study. It is optional. And so how does that differentiate for the state of California? Well, California mandates that HOAs and co-ops conduct a reserve study every three years to do a high level assessment of capital expenditure projects that need to be funded for so that when that timeline expires, the board of directors, the owners, whether you're a commercial real estate portfolio or living in a high rise luxury, everyone has been communicated with, tying back to communication and collaboration so that they fully understand where their money is going and why it is necessary for the, for the sustainability of a building, especially like Champlain Towers if you're 40 years of age or more. And so I think there's going to be tremendous scrutiny around these evaluations moving forward. There's going to be an encouragement of reserve studies. And although they're high level, it is a baseline for board members, whether that's commercial real estate or habitational high rise, to take that information and allow your stakeholders, your owners, fully understand why these investments are necessary. We talk about deferred maintenance. Well, those would be captured in a comprehensive reserve study as well, so that you're avoiding blind spots, but really taking the necessary steps and actions to mitigate risk, especially around life safety. So with uh, maybe for you and Lindsay, uh, Jonathan, is, um, you know, one of the questions came back here is uh, 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 what, what, what happened that could have been avoided in Florida? Well, there, there are a myriad of things that could have been avoided and could have happened. But first and foremost, you know, there is, for high-rise condominiums, there is a generalization and mindset where board members are pressured and feel the pressure to adhere to budgets and budgetary constraints because as costs go up to maintain the building, common areas, et cetera, as does your ownership and as does the cost to live in these buildings. And so I think first and foremost, you know, engaging a structural engineer, not every 40 years. If you look at Miami-Dade County, and I looked this up, according to Miami-Dade County, Section 8-11F, Buildings that are 40 years or older and high rise, they are required to do a recertification process to identify the structural integrity of the building to do an analysis, but also its electrical systems. Now the question is, is 40 years, is that is that really applicable in today's environment? So one recommendation could be board of directors, whether you're at on a condominium or you're um, facilitating a large commercial real estate portfolio is perhaps you update that frequency to every 10 years so that with the mindset that life safety is of the utmost importance, but you can take proactive measures moving forward if concerns have been identified. In my professional opinion, I think once every 40 years seems to be uh, a little risky. So one plan of action could be, you know, taking on that expense proactively, but doing it in a time frame that may not be once every 40 years, but perhaps once every 10 years. So that's one item. But Lindsay, I'll defer to you as well. Sure. Yeah, I would agree with you definitely, um, you know, taking a look at how often those inspections are done, not only doing them sooner rather than than later, you know, for all those reasons you just mentioned to take um, action for any corrective action items that need to be completed. Um, but also after maybe any additions or there's changes to the building, maybe that might change the structural load of the roof, things like that. Um, you should share those plans with um, a structural engineer and have them take a look, um, you know, that maybe if you, ha if you have them available, the as-built plans to, um, so when they're walking around to take a look at, you can point out um, any changes in the building that they could make note of. Yeah, being a board member is, is there's a lot of responsibility for that and you're and you do have the oversight and jonathan you and i have met with a few of the uh of our clients here uh, in the real estate in the hoas for the high-rise condos and 
there is some concern uh, amongst them, you know, because they are seated on a board right now and they've seen what happens. So that's kind of a wake up call. What, what else are they thinking about right now, Jonathan? Yeah, they're thinking, they're thinking about personal asset protection. They're thinking about their personal liability. And they're thinking about well, what level of coverage is adequate if I'm joining a board. Now, there are certain limitations with regards to personal liability risk. I'm not an attorney, so I will uh, preface by saying reach out to your legal counsel on your, that represents your HOA or represents your CRE exposure. But there's something called the good business judgment rule. And so board members are concerned about their personal liability. But one area that you are somewhat protected is that business judgment rule, meaning you and your colleagues on a board of directors are making sound business decisions. The expectation of a board is not to know everything. Remember, these are acting unpaid volunteers that have a huge fiduciary obligation to make good business decisions. And as long as you are documenting, you are being proactive in your, in your communication, you're collaborating with your ownership, and you are working with your risk management team, you're working with your legal counsel, and making sure you're adhering to the rules of the road, that will help board members reduce some of that personal liability. But Chip, there's a lot of anxiety out there because the question is, how much is enough? And the other thing to consider is moving forward, what incentive do board members have going forward to um, partake in a board when, during elections? And that's another animal that we haven't talked about, but it's a reality we can foresee in the future. Yeah, one of the things I heard and I learned, uh, and we're going to go to Mark here in a minute, let's flip the slide. But one of the things I heard is that, uh, you know, for an assessment to do the damage, you know, I have to live with these people as a board member. You know, they're my next door neighbors. And, you know, I just uh, voted to to, uh, to assess them a certain amount of money, which they weren't expecting to get some of these repairs done. And I think, you know, in the past until just lately here, um, people were, were hesitant to vote for for an assessment. So um, there, there were these board dilemmas, as you say, uh, you know, about uh, um, uh, whether they should make an assessment or not. So who wants to speak to this one? This is this is a huge topic for me, the board's dilemma. <clears throat> Mark, what do you think? If you're sitting on a board right now uh, and you saw this in Florida and you're thinking, okay, how is this, is this gonna happen to me? Um, you know, they, they, chain, they, 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 chan they have challenges of, of funding reserves sometimes uh, to adequate levels. Uh, they have um, maybe not enough insurance uh, because, you know, the building was damaged, in this case collapsed, you know, what, all this, all these are considered, what, bad decisions if there wasn't enough insurance, uh, and then DNO comes into play, doesn't it? Right. Well, it's not an automatically a bad decision. You know, if, as Jonathan said, you have to use good judgment, you know, and you have to use common sense. If you have this information and you ignore it, then you have a problem, uh, a potential problem. You know, and right now with COVID, as you know, as we can see in the slide, and, and as we know, the building costs, the repair costs, everything have gone up substantially. And one of the things that I think boards need to do right now is reassess, reassess their values, reassess their coverages, not just the, the uh, DNO, their property coverages, their liability coverages, everything that comes into play here to make sure that they're adequately covered in case the worst does happen. And that's on both the property and the liability side. And Mark, when you say DNO, you're referring to directors and officers liability. And when you say values, it's not the moral values of the board. It, it is the values of which they've given to the insurance company, which, which is the replacement per square foot of the building. And right. is that adequate? I think is, is what you're saying there is it have we given the, the insurance company the adequate ad information uh, through our broker and uh, and does that total up what you know a contractor would uh, charge us to rebuild or repair the building in 2021? Does that sound right. about right? Right, right. You know, and and you think about it, you know, in your own home value, whether it's a condo or whether it's a standalone structure in an association. Um, you know, every few years you should reevaluate what it would cost to rebuild that structure if it's damaged or if it's totaled. Um, the same thing needs to be done on the grander scale by the homeowners associations. 
So it says on the slide here that most HOAs have liability, Jonathan, uh, for directors and officers, uh, you know, or DNO insurance as we call it, but coverage is not uh, often enough. What is what does that mean? Not enough. Yeah, you know, it's it's a hard question to answer, but it really. So we're talking about liability here. You know, the cool thing about a, a DNO, a directors and officers form, it's a nonprofit form. So many times. Uh, the ones that are structured correctly, you can allow your DNO policy, let's say that's a million or a two million dollar limit, sit underneath what we call underline to a, an umbrella policy. So you can have a 10 million, 25 million dollar umbrella sitting excess of that DNO policy, which is very common in the HOA and co and co op world, particularly for high rise luxury. So, you know, if you are a board member of an HOA and you have a DNO policy, I would absolutely recommend just validating that your excess or umbrella coverage sits excess of those primary DNO limits so that you can come up with an adequate figure that works for you and your community. The other item I wanted to address, and we talked about property values. This has been a systemic issue amongst commercial real estate portfolios and habitational high-rise luxury condominiums like Champlain Towers. Unfortunately, the, prior to 2017, the market was incredibly competitive, competitive, incredibly soft, meaning you can get away with lower value as a basis to keep your premiums low. But reconstruction costs, the price of material, the price of steel, lumber, glass, all of that has accelerated, and that does not that does not maintain at a stagnant pace. So another way, as we're tying back reducing the DNO's liability, is to every year work with your risk management team to evaluate what that proper cost per square foot should be in the current market condition. I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and California tends to be one of the most expensive places to rebuild. I just read a report that San Francisco has now surpassed Tokyo as the most expensive place to rebuild and to construct apartments, condominiums, high-rise uh, high-rise buildings that cater to office space. And the price of lumber, for example, during COVID accelerated 300%. So I would recommend to all board members, whether it's commercial real estate or a high-rise place out, have risk management team do an evaluation, run the models, provide feedback to help you make a decision. You can also take it one step further. There are plenty of evaluation firms, even recommended by your property insurer, that you can engage in. An evaluation can cost up to $5,000, but it's a great due diligence idea and best practice for boards because that is the single best way to truly get the granular to identify what is really the cost of the current structure. And by doing that, you're reporting, you're documenting, and you can make a Fiscal, uh, fiscal betterment of the owners and for your tenants living in the or renting uh, properties um, that start to control. And unfortunately, undervaluation is a systemic issue. And I'll tell you, underwriters are asking more questions, and the days are gone. And most board members know this by the way. According to most CCNRs and governing documents, it says they're specifically that the has a fiduciary obligation to at one percent of principal value. If it's not, well, there's exposure. Well, uh, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, Jonathan. What, do, what have you seen with uh, out there with HOA communities and so forth? Are they uh, valued uh, uh, overly uh, high, or is it is it low? It, uh, they tend to be undervalued. Uh, yeah. They tend to be undervalued. Typically. Um, you see them anywhere between 180 a foot upwards of 250 a foot. Um, at Hub, we, use a, we have an agreement where we don't do anything below 300 a foot, especially in California, but we consider that the floor. Now, these are reinforced steel concrete buildings, and the likelihood of a fire having to crumble down is, is not probable, but you still have an obligation to insure. Working with many of our developers in the area, whether it's Los Angeles, whether it's Beverly Hills or San Francisco, 
their construction costs are averaging anywhere between 500 a foot but we just had one recently that wanted 900 a foot because that's what their costs were given that their their proximity to the water etc so you know the costs are significantly higher than what these general reports like a core logic like a marshall and swift are projecting and that's why i highly recommend our communities and our board members to really engage a third-party evaluation firm to find what that sweet spot is in terms of insurance to value. Well, like Mark said, uh, you know that the, the values are important, and you don't want to scrimp on those because that'll that'll bite you later if there is a claim because there won't be enough insurance. Lindsay, you're in the risk services side at, at Hub, and you are um, there to help our clients eliminate risk best you can and values is one of those things pml's probable maximum losses which are basically an underwriter's guess as to what the damage might be to a building what sort of services do you offer to help clients uh, who are board members of either hoas or commercial portfolios Sure. Yeah, we were just touching on a great one as as values and, and chip, as you mentioned, with um, PMLs. Uh, one thing that we can do and, you know, uh, there's many companies out there that can that could do it, but do a, a catastrophic risk modeling report. So a cat model uh, for short. And basically that would be able to um, help you determine what major perils, whether it's flood, tropical cyclone, uh, winter storm, earthquake, are more likely to affect your property um, based on your general location, your construction, and, and multiple other factors. But that type of report can help you prepare for catastrophic events, um, as well as make sure that you have the right coverage and limits on your policy by mapping those worst case um, scenarios. And, and speaking of worst case scenarios, that's another, um, I would also recommend, you know, conducting post event inspections. So inspections following a major weather event uh, to identify any damage, whether, um, you know, it's structural issues or minor things like locked drains, those can lead to significant property damage as a result of, of water ponding and other things like that. But cat modeling is, is a great resource to, again, um, help you be prepared for events that are more likely to affect your operations as well as um, you know make sure your coverage and, and limits are right for your policy. And when you say cat you're referring to catastrophic uh, perils such as earthquake, windstorm, flood, things like that that uh, could impact the building all at once. Um, so th those are important things and it sure sounds like you got a lot to think about about being a board member these days Mark. Um, you know, the, it says down there on the bottom bullet there, if a board member is named in a lawsuit, the plaintiffs could potentially go after your personal assets. I don't like to hear that. Are you going to help me? Sure. I, I mean, that's where the directors and officers, the DNO insurance comes in. You know, that's the, one of the main reasons that people buy it is to protect their personal assets. Um, you know, and uh, as long as you're acting in good faith and you're, you're following your duties, then you're not going to have a problem or you shouldn't have a problem, I would say, um, you know, with regard to your coverage. The question becomes whether you're adequately protected and how much you should have. Um, and that's going to be a factor of a lot of things. You know, the, the value of the property on which board you're sitting, um, your assets, the, the potential for loss. There's a whole host of things and that's where your professional risk managers and insurance brokers can help guide you and give you opinions on that as well. So um, one of the questions came in, which is kind of an interesting one. And if I'm a board member of an HOA or a commercial portfolio, and I'm looking at the, the spread of risk and stuff like that, and things look pretty good, but I don't know what I don't know. Should board members carry the, their own DNO insurance in addition to the organization? It, you're not going to be able to get it. it, it it's it's so that's a no. <laughs> it's going to be the board that's going to be able to buy it. Um, there and and most personal policies have exclusions for these sorts of things. Um, well, what, if, what if the board doesn't buy DNO insurance? Should I just get off, or can I go buy it myself? Uh, you can try and buy it yourself. Um, 
Absolutely, you know, try, um, but I think it's going to be difficult to obtain. It's best for the board to get it um, and, you know, to protect both the, the board members and the organization. That's the best route to go. What, what are the steps? This is a question that came in. Thank you for submitting it. Uh, what are the, the, the most important steps, um, starting with the most important thing that the Florida board members uh, must take to avoid personal liability at this point? Is there anything they can do? At this point? Yeah. Well, I think, that, I think that's a no. I think, you know, it basically, I think that what's happened here is is that the ship has sailed and, and lawyers are going to get involved and there's going to be all sorts of lawsuits and so forth like that. And it is what it is. And one of the things that I just learned was that uh, between Jonathan and Lindsay, a board member, you really want documentation, don't you? Well, and that's what I was going to say. The one thing that you can do is gather all the documentation from your board meetings and, and the reasons that you did things. And the better your documentation and the better your reasons and justifications for what you did or did not do is going to help you. That's the number one thing that you can do now. Question came in, um, if, if the board at the towers is deemed at fault, in other words, the board is at fault and the family members, you know, go ahead and sue, is insurance going to cover this typically not not we're not asking you for your legal opinion on this one but typically would there be coverage there or a defense and coverage typically as long as it's deemed negligent and they were using their best judgment etc then yes there should be defense and there should be coverage for there okay well let's go to the next slide there's more questions coming in so what, what can you do as a board member? Um, you know, we, we talked about getting expert advice, identifying the key management experts that are there out there. Lindsay, you know, you would be a resource for that uh, with risk services, um, you know, and uh, I guess, Jonathan, you know, how, how do board members decide uh, what coverages on like uh, liability, uh, earthquake, windstorm? I mean, you know, you're, you're not going to buy you're not going to buy everything. You can't afford it. So how do people decide? How do you advise your clients as to what limits they should buy? The collaborative approach, Chip, at the end of the day, you know, it's providing a model. Of, so, for example, Lindsay brought up a probable maximum loss survey. So in yeah. California, our catastrophic peril is earthquake coverage. In a place like Florida, where Champlain Towers was, it is your hurricanes, storms, and floods. So being able to take those models like a probable maximum loss survey and identifying what the worst case scenario is in terms of total damage and what that loss expectancy looks like, that is your first step. Taking it a step further would be engaging your risk manager and your broker partner to go out to the marketplace to see what viable solutions are out there. And identifying the cost option. Now, oftentimes you're not going to insure to the 100% value if you're buying earthquake, a hurricane or flood policy, but perhaps there is a certain loss limit you can purchase that fits within the budgetary needs and the budget of an association or a commercial risk portfolio. Lindsay, this brings up a point from what I heard from Jonathan is that, you know, it, it is about the values. It is about all that. What other perils you know, we have New York, we have Texas, we have the Gulf, we have across the country. What other types of uh, uh, sophisticated software uh, engineering do we have that uh, can give us a probable maximum loss for, you know, what other perils are out there that, uh, that can be measured? Yeah, um, all the major weather related ones, you know, we've talked about hurricane, earthquake, um, winter storms up in the northeast, um, winter weather, there's severe thunderstorms, which with that can bring heavy winds, rain, hail, things like that. Um, flood is is a big one for, for many folks. Um, and then additionally, actually, um, there is modeling that can um, 
be used to determine terrorism. So there's actually um, relative to airplane crashes and or chemical, biological, nuclear uh, attacks um, that can be measured as well. But more often than not, when we talk about cat modeling, we're focusing on the perils. And related to that, you know, when you're thinking about hiring a building inspector, it's a good idea that you hire someone that not only specializes in commercial inspections, but they're also, uh, you know, understanding of the local area and they should be familiar with the signs of structural damage due to that local weather, whether it's snow and snow loading and ice dams or it's coastal areas, which we've been talking about um, with hurricanes or um, salt water, things like that. They should have a good knowledge base on the local weather that could affect the building structures that they're looking at. Are building inspectors hard to get right now? Are they, uh, sorry, building inspectors hard to get right now? They they seem to maybe be the, uh, the darling of the dance at the moment. I would uh, take a guess that down, especially in the Florida area, it might be pretty tough uh, right now. So it's good to form relationships just as you would, you know, from a risk perspective. We always talk about restoration companies to come in after a flood or a, an event and to have those relationships beforehand so that when you give them a call, when there is a hurricane or another catastrophic event, you're top of their list to know you, you've built that relationship and they'll put you in front of the line to, uh, to help and support you. Yes, the relationships. Uh, being in front of the line is good. Uh, Mark, I don't know that you can answer this question, but it came in anyways. So if you can answer this, you're 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 the smartest uh, uh, broker I know. How much liability insurance is enough? <laughs> That's a tough one here. But you know there are some parameters uh, for DNO and and stuff, and you probably can help people benchmark. Yes, and I'll tell you that the answer today is different than the answer it was before Champlain Towers. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, you know, that has definitely opened up uh, a whole new discussion. Um, the, but the, working with an experienced broker is the way to go. You know, we do have benchmarks, we have modeling, um, we have ways to help evaluate. As I said a little bit earlier, you know, it's going to depend on the total values, the property values, the total exposures. It's not a number that's going to be the same for every organization. Um, it's going to be higher or lower depending on you know, the exposures that you have. And also one of the things that people should be aware of in light of Champlain Towers is the prices, I believe, are going to go up. I think that we're going to see a paradigm shift here. And what you paid today is probably not what you're going to pay tomorrow. Um, underwriters have now, you know, seen the risks, you know, previously when you were talking about HOAs, a lot of times, you know, you may be talking about, you know, uh, problems with tennis courts, disputes about parking, you know, little things like that, that are important, but in light of what we saw at Champlain really are kind of petty. Now the underwriters have seen, you know, what, what the possible catastrophic exposure is, and they're going to take a longer and harder look at underwriting these HOAs and these exposures. And I think part of that is we're going to see pricing going up. But you'll do what you can to keep those prices down, right? If you've got, all the, you got all the material Jonathan and Lindsay's talking about, that probably will help if you can show the, the, the underwriters that, that the HOA or the uh, commercial building owners and those boards have done their homework, I would think you would get better favorable rates, right? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're also going to focus on the experience of the board members, you know, and what their background is and to show that, you know, that these are well managed organizations that the people have experience that they make good decisions that they take good notes, you know, those sorts of things that they document what they do and that's absolutely going to help. Um, you know, those are the those are the types of things that that we'll do and help get the best pricing possible and the best coverage as possible. Let's take a look at the next slide. And while we're doing that, Mark, um, is there a difference between, um, we got a question in here. It says, um, is, there, is there a difference in rate or, or liability coverage? Or is there a difference between nonprofit and profit board members in the DNO space uh, that own commercial real estate and uh, HOAs? Is there a difference? Yeah, um, not, yes, there is. Not for nonprofits tend to be a little bit cheaper. And why is that? Because they're just they're they're volunteers, right? 
Correct. Correct. Yeah. They're not professional managers the way, you know, commercial property is. So if I'm a, a volunteer, I would expect to pay less in DNO insurance than I would if I'm professional because the professionals are held to a higher standard with potentially more liability. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So key, key D, DNO insurance considerations. I mean, why don't you just take us through this? Because I think, you know, without getting too technical for, for everybody today, but there are some things in DNO that you should know um, after what happened in Florida and uh, talk a little bit about what side A and B and C is. And you'll be the smartest person at the board meeting if you know this. Sure. So there's typically three parts of your policy, side A, side B, and side C. Side A and side B both cover the individual directors and officers and protect their personal assets. The difference is that the side A covers the directors for things that the uh, HOA is prohibited or has not agreed to indemnify them for. Side B protects the personal assets of the individual directors and officers for things that the board has um, agreed to indemnify them for. Another key difference is side A insurance doesn't have a deductible. It's dollar one. So you, if, if defense costs or anything, the insurance kicks in automatically. Side B, there's a deductible that's borne by the association. And side C protects the association itself for claims against the association. So side C is important, but I think most people today are, they're worried about A and B. And so A is for things that I am responsible for. Is that correct? It's yes, but things that the board cannot pay on your behalf. So claims of, of wrongdoing for which the board either cannot by statute or has not in their bylaws or elsewhere agreed to indemnify the individual for. That's what side A is for. And that's why I want to know that I have side B too, right? Otherwise I'm exposed? Well, side B is similar coverage, but that's for things where the board has agreed to indemnify the individual. And there's a deductible associated with that coverage. So in, in, in an illustration, then, if I'm a board member of a commercial property or HOA and there is an uncovered claim um, and something happens and now we're being sued and uh, it's and the board has said in writing, I think, that, that the assets of the property or the real estate will be spent before I have to go dip into my personal pocket, that would be covered under B? If, if the... Yes. In other words, if the entity is indemnifying me before yes. I have to pay out of my own pocket, yes. uh, I want to make sure I got coverage B there too, and I'll be happy, right. to, I'll be happy to pay the deductible. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But at the same time, most of the policies are structured as well that side A, if for some reason um, B does not, uh, for example, um, we often structure policies that if the board would, or if the company uh, has agreed to indemnify, but for some reason doesn't, the side A will still pay and then go after the board for it. So it can be structured that way as well. So this is tricky stuff. And uh, if I'm on a board, you know, I get a certificate of insurance. If I haven't gotten one, I should ask for one? Absolutely. I, that's the first thing that I would do before I agreed to be on a board is I would want to know what kind of insurance they've got. And then How run, much, the what's it cover? And run, and run the certificate by you first before I oh, say yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> or maybe even Jonathan. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, back to the, here's the question, what limits should we purchase? And I, I think the answer probably is that, you know, larger portfolios, Jonathan, larger buildings, higher limits, small, smaller locations, less risk, uh, lower limits as to what those are. I mean, you're probably like a realtor. You can walk in and say, well, you know, on this portfolio uh, or this particular high rise, your peer group is buying 15 or $25 million. You should be in that range. Is that how it works? That, that, that's right. And every building is going to be unique, but if you have a high rise luxury condominium and you have a minimum of $100 million in total insurable values to replace, let's use that as a baseline. Typically, you're going to see a DNO policy range from 10 all the way up to 50 million dollars in coverage it's really going to be backed by that excess umbrella 
if you're a mid-rise, let's say you're you know, five stories, anywhere between 25 million to 50 million to rebuild, um, you know, those limits may not be necessary. Maybe it's a five million, maybe it's a 10 million. Um, but I can tell you in the frequency of claims that we see, three fourths of those are water damage or escape liquids. And then we see about 15% on the DNO line. Luckily, in over 20 years of the program business we, we've had for our luxury condominiums, we've only had one claim that uh, pierced the umbrella in which they had to draw down from, but it was only an additional million dollars and they had 50 million at the time. Um, so, you know, I think it just goes back to partnerships. We talked a lot about that. Collaborating, allowing the risk manager to benchmark this data to showcase where buildings or commercial real estate asset portfolios like yours, where they lie. And then at the end of the day, it's going to be a decision that works for not only the board members, but for the community and budget, et cetera. And you'll, and you'll provide pricing options, right? Oh, absolutely. We'll, we'll provide pricing options and, um, you know, help guide along the way. You know, talk about, and it's becoming a theme is collaborate in partnerships. One area as we're looking at mitigating board members' risk is these insurance companies are also your partners. They are just as motivated as you as a board is to reduce their liability or their property exposure. So oftentimes every year they're going every year or every couple of years depending on how long they've been in the property, they're going to go out and do an on-site survey. And they're going to provide a risk engineering report with their findings. And they're going to rank some of the critical items that they need to be And then some are nice to have, but may not be priority. As a board member on a commercial real estate portfolio or a high-rise HOA, take those seriously. Your insurance partners are not there to deem you or to find discrepancies or concerns um, you know, to, to charge you more premium. They're trying to bring awareness to the situation and those investments you make proactively and those relationships you build with your insurance partners are not only going to help you in the long term, but it's gonna provide a tremendous amount of goodwill and strengthen that partnership all, all while you are documenting and taking those seriously. Unfortunately, we see a risk engineering report delivered to an HOA for a commercial real estate portfolio, and then it's just set to the side and it's business as usual. With what happened at Champlain Towers, this is going to create a reverberating effect on the entire landscape nationally. So my recommendation, take those reports seriously. Work with your risk management partner on an action plan on satisfying some of those recommendations and work with your insurer. They have every motivation to assist you and mitigate their exposure as well especially over the long term and part of what uh, a broker should offer and i know hub does is um claims claims advocacy mark um are you an attorney i am but i am not practicing <laughs> good 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 you're, you're one of us then um but we do have attorneys on staff right for dno eno epli yep. claims and so forth why, why do we need attorneys to advocate for our clients? Well, there's a number, there's a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, you know, most of the claims people in this realm are going to be attorneys. Um, second, the, the policies are complicated and they, they're written in legalese. And if you've got somebody who's familiar with it, somebody who, um, you know, is legally trained, it's going to be easier for them to understand the language, understand the nuances, and it's going to be easier and better for them to advocate on your behalf for the appropriate uh, outcome of the claim. Yeah. So how, how do you, if I'm a, a board member, how do I review the policy? Do I just read it? Uh, do I look for a summary? Do I give it to you? <laughs> sure, you can give it to us and, and we can go over it, um, which is, you know, really a good idea. But if you're if you're reading it on your own, what I always advise people is you start with the with the insuring agreement, which is generally one of the first paragraphs, which tells you, you know, what they cover, and then I go to the exclusions, because these policies, contrary to what any insurance policy, contrary to what a lot of people think, don't cover everything, and it's important to read the exclusions right after 
the coverage grant, in my opinion. So you have an idea what the insurance company is looking not to cover. And then you, uh, you, have, an, you have a better idea um, of what your exposure is and areas that maybe you thought you had coverage or you want to have coverage, you work with your broker, work with the insurance carrier, negotiate for those coverages back. Sometimes you can get them just for asking. Sometimes they may cost a little bit of money. Um, but if you don't ask, you definitely won't get. Um, and that to me is one of the most important parts of any insurance policy is the exclusions. What are they not covering? Because I can tell you, going back to the claim scenario, that is the first thing that the claims department is going to look at. Is this covered? Is there an exclusion here that is going to, to uh, make this claim not covered? So you want to know before you have a problem, you know, what am I not covered for in this situation and can I get coverage for it? So you advocate uh, uh, for the client in this regard. So you, that's why we have attorneys is to advocate for the clients and so forth. And we're not replacing the attorneys at the insurance company and so forth. But this stuff is that complicated that you do need, you know, counsel uh, to advocate for you as well. And certainly if you need your own lawyer, we'll tell you that too. But right. uh, what, what, are the, what do the insurance companies do? They're supposed to be defending us. And, and I think most of them do a fairly good job. How, what, what, how important is it that they have a pre-selected good law firm? You know, that's, that's a really good idea. Um, now, first of all, all the insurance carriers have panel counsel and they've panel. got- What is a panel? Uh, they, have, they have lawyers that they have vetted, they have selected and interviewed and negotiated with that specialize in the area of coverage. So for example, if you have a director's and officer's claim, you don't want a divorce lawyer handling it. You right. don't necessarily, you don't want a property lawyer handling it. So they have lists of attorneys that specialize in the particular area for that uh, coverage. So they've got specialized directors and officers. If it's a property policy, they've got people, lawyers that are specialists in that, if it's general liability, that sorts of things. If you've got your own attorneys that, especially in, in commercial situations, that know your business, that know the area, that's something that can be discussed with the insurance carriers upfront as well. And if they meet the criteria that the insurance company is looking for for that line of coverage, then oftentimes we can get them endorsed on or, or agreed to upfront that, hey, if there's a claim and it's this type of a claim, it's going to go to this attorney. And it's pre-negotiated, it's pre-set. Um, and, and that's another way that you can handle that. But also, you know, I do want to tell you, you know, rest assured that if you are using one of the insurance company's attorneys, you know, they have been vetted and interviewed, and they do have the qualifications to handle the type of claim that's being presented under the particular policy. What if I want to use my own my own lawyer down the street, my neighbor? Then you're going to pay for it out of your own pocket, and you're not going to have insurance coverage. Yeah, um, probably, you know, probably all of these, yeah. Right. I mean, and again, it goes back to what I said. They don't want divorce lawyers handling complex litigation uh, yeah. that they're not qualified to handle. Um, and, and all of these policies have a requirement that before an attorney is hired, even if you've got it in the policy, you've got to put them on notice. You've got to let them know that there's a claim. They have to understand it. They have to acknowledge it. They have to agree that you're going to retain this person uh, and go from there. Um, you can't go out and get your own attorney just because there's a claim and then run up lots of money, lots of expenses, and then go to the insurance company and present the bill. They're not going to accept that. Yeah, I, I think that this is probably one of the most important things for people today to remember is that, you know, if you if you pay very little for insurance, the law firm you get is probably going to get paid of very little. And the little the little payment of the, the attorneys that are billing out at one hundred dollars, one hundred eighty dollars an hour are probably not that experienced in this, are they, Mark? Probably not, you know, but again, you know, depending on the, the line of coverage that you're going to get, I mean, you're not paying for a director's and officer's policy, you're not paying a little bit of money and you're going to get, you know, a commensurate attorney, but yes, you pay, you get what you pay for. The, that's what I was looking for. Cause that's what I always thought was that uh, uh, one of the th first things that I want to look for is things like this hammer clause, uh, who the panel of counsel is, things like that. Uh, are very important. Let's jump to the next slide. You know, there's, there's one other thing I would like to say as long as we're talking about claims yeah. is 
it's very important to report claims timely that if you don't report them timely then you may blow your coverage you may not have any coverage. Jonathan shaking his head yes <laughs> and, he agrees. and that that goes along with the discussion of you can't hire your own attorney and expect the carrier to pay for it you know and one of the things that we encourage our clients to do is contact us your broker if you think there's a claim a claim isn't necessarily a lawsuit it can be a letter and it's very important that those letters get reported to the carrier because it will trigger coverage. And then, um, and if it and if it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of a claim, it can be what's called a notice of potential, which means it's not a claim today, but we have reason to believe that somewhere down the road it may be a claim. And those should be reported to your carrier as well to preserve your rights, because depending on what's in there, it may be enough information to trigger a duty to defend or a duty to investigate on the part of the carrier. So we encourage our clients at any time you have any doubt, you have any question, is something a claim? Is something? Uh, is it something that I should report? Reach out to us and we'll help guide you on that. I got one more question on that, but before I do that, I think at this point uh, in, in our session here today is this is probably where you want to take a a picture with your cell phone or a screenshot uh, of our, our slide uh, here today. Uh, while we've been all talking in the background, somebody's been scurrying to put all this together for us and took away the six major points from today that, that Jonathan and Mark and Lindsay have made. So you might want to take a look at all that because, you know, right now I'm, I'm hearing that if I'm a board member, you know, the things that I probably wanted to jot down today is that I really have to communicate with, with you know, both my vendors and, and my constituents, my tenants and stuff, whether it's HOAs or commercial uh, portfolios and so forth, you've got to really start documenting this stuff. Um, I, I've heard of, you know, collapse claims on balcony. How many people uh, maximum are supposed to be on that? It needs to be documented. Um, you know, reserve studies every three years, um, you know, need to be taken seriously. I don't think they have been taken seriously about, you know, what are our reserves uh, for, for financial things, you know, that are critical like the boiler and machinery, the, the elevators and things like that that you find in commercial buildings. Collabor collaboration, uh, legal and, and uh, financial decisions uh, and communicate those again to, to those tenants as to why you're making these decisions. You know, because what Mark said is, is, you know, as long as you're practicing and you're doing it, and what did you say, good faith? Um, you know, you'll be, you'll be protected. Did I get that right, Mark? Yes. Yeah. And then conduct quarterly and annual risk management surveys, reviews. Lindsay was talking about that. You know, when when should I be reviewing it? Jonathan was saying that some people do it every 40 years. But, you know, Lindsay pointed out if, if you're going to have some changes made to the building, if you've got some uh, uh, new walls that have taken in or taken out, if you've got new plumbing and so forth like that, that, that has been put into the building and you jacuzzi, uh, uh, maybe additional office space, uh, tenant improvements that uh, that have been changed. Maybe it's time to, to look at your assets again and do evaluation for replacement cost in the year 2021. I know that Jonathan was saying earlier that that just because of uh, all the the, the the construction that is now booming and the lack of construction during during COVID in the last year or so, construction costs are, are double or in sometimes triple what they were. Well, if you're sitting with a valuation of your building from 2000. 18 or 2017 or even 2019, it's 30% off according to that. So that's no good. That means you're underinsured and as a board member, you don't want to do that. I uh, heard about mitigating uh, exposures uh, by lawsuits, by documenting, documenting, documenting your actions, uh, as well as, as practicing good judgment. In other words, were you fully informed as best as possible? Were you appropriately informed? And that's what you want to make sure is that you have a, 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 an informed decision going forward. And for those of you who are volunteers, this is tough. This is tough. I'm volunteering and my assets may be, you know, penetrable. And uh, so obviously you would need somebody like Mark to make sure that, uh, that, that they're covered. Third party property valuations. We, we've talked about that a, a bit. And Jonathan, you, you felt that really that is one of the Achilles heels of commercial real estate and the HS, HOAs is that some people equate lower values that they say the replacement cost is lower. They, they, they equate that with lower premiums and that's not true. Uh, they sometimes think that if the least information they give Jonathan or Mark, the cheaper the insurance is gonna be. And it's the opposite. 
if there is a hole in the application that Jonathan is submitting, the computer is rated up as the most expensive part. So if you don't tell them it's a steel frame building, they'll downgrade the computer will automatically go to old wood and the rates go right up. So you wanna make sure you got uh, complete information. And as a board member, you deserve to see what the applications look like and what, what is being submitted on your behalf. Um, I just wanna give one last uh, uh, shout out to Jonathan and say if you've got any wrap up words and then I'll go to Mark and Lindsay. Quickly, we have about 15 seconds each. It's unfortunate that a lot of these lessons learned and a lot of these best practices come out of a tragedy like this, but take this seriously, take valuation seriously, collaborate as much as you can. And as Chip had mentioned, you know, it is so important to work with others that are experts in the field because you're a non-paid volunteer. And although we have business owners and entrepreneurs on these boards, you're not gonna know everything about everything. So have the humility to reach out to the right people so that you can get proper guidance so that you are making those good business judgment decisions. Mark, what do you say? Document everything. Document as much as possible. There's an old saying. You are a lawyer. You are a lawyer. <laughs> there's an old saying that if it's not written down, it didn't happen. And in a lawsuit, the more documentation you have, the better. The other thing is consult and work with your brokers. Don't be afraid to ask them questions. They're there to help you. We're here to help you. We're here to explain things. These are contracts. Insurance policies are contracts they can be complicated ask a lot of questions don't be afraid to bug your insurance broker we're here to answer your questions and set you on the right path yeah i have to say that uh, you know i've been doing insurance for over 30 years and guys like mark have uh, forgotten more than than i've known in my entire you know career i think i'm pretty good at this stuff on the dno epli uh, errors and emissions and stuff and then you sit next to somebody like mark and then you find out this stuff is really really complicated and that's why brokers like hub have expertise you know both on the property casualty side with jonathan uh, on the dno side with mark and lindsay your last word on risk services how to keep these claims from happening Sure. I, I would agree with everything that's been said and um, echo Jonathan's you know, note in the beginning that it's unfortunate it takes an incident like this that we have to have these conversations. And I would say with a lot of the catastrophic events we see, whether it's um, freezing in, in Texas and we have um, all sorts of issues there to an active shooter incident, it's front page on the newspaper, it's all over, you know, it's popping up on your social media and it's front of mind and, and we tackle it. Um, at the time, and I would just say my takeaway is proactive risk management to everybody on the line, continue your proactive risk management, no matter if there's an event that occurs, you know, if we can um, tackle it on the proactive side, as opposed to the reactive side, you'll be a lot better off. Thank you, Lindsay. Let's move to the next slide and wrap this up. So protect ma what matters most. And in this case, it's yourself. You want to make sure that you're covered if you're going to be a volunteer or even if you're a paid board member. And Hub International can help. We've got people, we've got brokers on the street like Mark uh, who uh, specialize in DNO, that know the contracts, they know all the markets, they know the legalese. He's actually an attorney, um, but a good one, a good one. He works for us, he works for you. Uh, we've got guys like Jonathan Nakaro who are out on the street that know the HOAs, they know commercial property real well, they know the liability of the property uh, markets as well. And it's, uh, it's a madhouse out there right now. It's a hard market. We've uh, been in a hard market for the last couple of years, hard market meaning less coverage and higher prices for everybody. And Lindsay's there to keep you safe. Um, you know, not a lot of brokers have that. So, you know, protect what matters, conduct an insurance review, uh, tailor your insurance to your properties. Don't take something off the shelf. Uh, provide the buildings with site risk management programs that Lindsay can help you design and advise on the right qualified uh, building inspector uh, for your property. In other words, they may be hard to get right now, but get it scheduled and get a relationship with somebody out there that, that you can call in in time of need. So on behalf of Jonathan Nicaro, Mark Morris, and Lindsay Shapiro, I'm Chip Stewart from Hub International and the Real Estate Practice. We wanna thank you for attending today's webinar. And if you do have more questions, we tried to get to as many as we could today. Uh, you can actually email us at hubinternational.com backslash real estate dash, uh, well, uh, real estate, and we'll get back to you with an answer uh, ASAP. Thank you again.